Tasmania, Sarah Island, September 1822. As silent as they possibly could, eight men board a small open boat and then push themselves out into the harbour. If they are seen, the entire operation is botched and they would be mercilessly flogged or even hanged. They cannot let it happen, so they keep on rowing away from the Macquarie Harbour penal station. This prison within the penal colony of Tasmania was the worst one in all of Australia. People who were sent there had committed a crime as a convict in Australia, and it was rare seeing someone not sick, wounded or starving. These men had got enough of their horrendous treatment and had stolen one of the boats used for transporting the convicts for labour to the mainland and planned to escape to the nearest settlement. The problem was that the distance to the nearest settlement was almost a hundred miles over some of Australia's worst terrain. When they landed on the other side, they crushed the bottom of the boat with an axe. The man in possession of this axe, Robert Greenhill, became the self-proclaimed leader of the group. He was formerly a sailor from Middlesex. He had tried to escape once before with his friend, the Irishman Matthew Travers. The other Ironman in the group was Alexander Pass, and another of the convicts was also on his second escape attempt, William Kennelly. A former soldier named William Dalton, a Scottish baker, Jan Mayfair, a highwayman, Thomas Bodenham, and a man named Edward Brown were also with them in the escape. They walked quietly for most of the day. When it was time to set up camp, they did not dare to light a fire. Before them lay treacherous terrain, with mountains and woods where it was impossible to walk in a straight line and not get lost. It did not help either that they were the first non-aboriginals who ever walked there, or that it still today rare people to walk there because of the rough terrain. But this fact was unknown to the convicts, he just continued to cut a path in front of them. When night fell, they were so exhausted they did not care if anyone would notice the fire they created. They slept huddled up into the cliffs to try to get some rest before the following day's hard march. Within a week, Green started to soak the convicts, who had now ran out of rations. Tired, hungry and soaking, they were unable to light a fire most nights. Edward Brown, not as good a walker as the others, considered they fell behind, and the rest threatened to leave him behind if he could not keep a better pace. And one evening, the convicts started to squabble over who would light a fire, so in the end each convict made his own. And as hunger started to kick in once again, Kennelly told Greenland and Pass that he was so hungry he could eat a man, a thought that could not leave the minds of the convicts. The starving Greenhill spent the next day pondering Kennelly's words that the evening he gathered Travers, Mayfair and Pass and tried to persuade them that if they wanted to survive, one of them had to die to stop the others from starving. Mater protested, trying to convince them that it was useless since they did not know how to prepare human meat. It was just as cooking regular meat, and instead went on to discuss who would be the first victim. Greenell proposed that it should be Dalton, as he thought that he had volunteered as a flogger back in the harbour, but had no evidence of this. He told others that he would strike a killing blow, but others needed help. In the middle of the night, Greenland walked up to the sleeping Dalton and let his axe do the work. Travis then cut the man's throat, the others cut his clothes, gutted and beheaded him. Travis and Greenhill proceeded to cook and eat his heart and liver, and asked the others if they would try, but no one did, or at least not yet. But the next day, hunger won, and the meat was split by the seven convicts, but Brown was certain he would be next as he was slower so started to walk more and more slowly, soon coming out of sight of the others, and then changed direction to try to find his way back to the harbour. Kennel also feared for his life, so did the same. When the other lady noticed, they tried to find them, but were unable to do so, and gave up. When Brown and Kennelly finally made it back to the harbour, they were half dead and lay on the beach, hoping for someone to find them. The gods soon did, with human meat still in their pockets. They were taken back to the station hospital, where they both died a few days later. Soon the others came across a river, and while Greenhill, Pass and Mefa got over quite easily, Bodenham and Travers needed help from the others. This sealed Bodenham's fate, as he was the weakest, and Travers was Greenhill's friend. So, when hunger started kicking once again, when they finally crossed the mountain, it was his turn to die. Greenhill was once again the one to strike and they started to feast on Thomas Bodenham's flesh.
They soon reached open plains full of kangaroos, just added to their frustration as there was no way for them to catch the game. They all now agreed that we would all die together before anything should happen, but Mater did not trust Greenhill Ward, so he walked with Pierce a bit away from two friends and said, Pierce, let us go by ourselves. You see what kind of man Greenhill is? He would eat his own father before he would fast one day. But there was no way for them to do this. Even if Pass would have agreed, the planes were too open for them to be able to slip away as Brown and Kenley had done. And Greenhill was in possession of the axe, and it was not like he would let his food get away. They were also so weak, no one would be able to overpower or run away from the others. Soon, the last of Bodenham's meat was cooked, and they shared the last of it, except Mephas, who rather ate some fan roots he had found. But this severely disrupted his digestive systems, resulting in him vomiting. Greenland saw this as a good reason to kill him now, so grabbed his axe and struck the man in the back of the head. But the strike was not clean and only grazed Mater's. He tried to wrestle the axe from Greenhill before he could strike again. But Travers and Paris got up and calmed the two men down, stopping their fighting. But Mater's now knew he was the next in line and how pointless it would be to try to escape or to kill Greenhill. So he accepted his fate and asked to be granted a Christian death. His wish was accepted and he kneeled down in a cove for an hour praying before Greenhill came and dealt the fatal blow. The three men continued and Paris knew he would be next and would be killed as soon as Mater's remains were gone. But one day as they walked, Travers got bit by a snake which started to slow him down. He asked the two others to just leave him, but Greenhill refused and tried to tend to his wounds. Soon it was so bad he needed to be carried, but Greenhill persisted. Travers became even weaker as he did not dare to fall asleep. And soon, he was so much of a burden, and asked the others to just kill him, and so they did, feasting on his flesh. Now only two men remained, and Greenhill was the one with the axe. The two men started to walk further apart, and when it was time to rest for the night, instead of sleeping, the two men stared at each other, hoping for the other to be the first one to daze. Greenhill neither just attacked Pierce, as their separation would prepare Pierce for it way in advance and he never wanted another situation as with Mepha. But the staring started to be less and less intense, and lack of sleep started to show more and more, and he started to daze, if just for a few seconds. But soon it was more than that, and Greenhill had fallen into a slumber. Once Pass was certain this was the case, he did not waste a single second, and walked up to Greenhill, grabbed his axe, and struck him as hard as he could, killing his fellow cannibal. Paris fell asleep soon after and prepared Greenhill's meat the day after. He continued for several days, chewing away at Greenhill's flesh, pondering suicide when he comes up to an abandoned Aboriginal campsite. It turned out the Aboriginals had fled the sight of him, leaving some meat behind. This meant Pierce could survive longer. He soon found a river which he followed, and after a few days, he stumbled into a group of sheep and grabbed one of them and started to eat it raw. But Shepherd saw him and held him at gunpoint. But yet another stroke of luck came to the cannibal, as the farmer named Maguire knew him and took Paz and what remained of the sheep into his cottage and fed the half starved man. Maguire and other Irish farmers cared for Paz for a few weeks. Pierce then joined a group of bush rangers who were eventually captured, and Pert confessed his whole story to the police. But not a word of it was believed, and he thought he was covering up for the others. So he was sent back to Macquarie Harbour. He became popular among other convicts who wanted to know a secret, how he escaped this awful prison and survived. A young man named Thomas Cox was especially interested and convinced Pierce to run away with him, this time to the north instead of the east, but it was still completely unexplored territory. When the two men reached the river, Pierce started to prepare to swim across, but Cox could not swim, and outraged at the incompetence of his companion, Pierce killed him. When a ship later saw a fire Pierce had created and went to explore, he saw him just sitting there, already eating cocks and now confessing to the murder and cannibalism. Even when the sailors clearly could see bread and non-human meat still at the campsite. For this, Pierce was sentenced to hanged. 
Convict Cannibal escapees from Macquarie Harbor was not even a one-time incident as a very similar event takes place eight years later.